All right. Hello, this is Kelsey Hightower here, and I'm going to be moderating the CNCF On Demand webinar. And today we're going to be talking about VPC networking beyond the cloud. Now, why is VPC so important? For the last seven years, as you all may know, I've been at Google Cloud and I've had a lot of jobs before then, and I know what it's like to work inside of a data center. You rack and stack servers, you create your leap and spine network, you got routers, you got top of rack switches, and I've made my fair share of Cat5 cables. And in that architecture, automation is key. Like I get it, we need to provision all of those ports. Maybe you're setting up VLANs, but for the most part, a lot of our automation tools are kind of doing a one-to-one -one mapping of the standard configuration. Now, if you're like me and you have some experience in the cloud, you know, things are very different when you get to the cloud. There is no concept of ports and VLANs. Those things are kind of hidden from you. And instead you get a new abstraction. And for years, we've just been thinking about that abstraction as VPC. When you create a VM, you just attach it to a VPC. You create a Kubernetes cluster, again, you just attach it to a VPC. And typically that VPC is gonna give you an IP address and deal with any other routing concerns that you may have. And so when I think back to like people coming from on-prem and to the cloud, well, one of the big differences that we actually don't talk about enough, we always talk about the differences in compute and VMs, maybe even the differences in load balancers and security things like IAM, but hardly do we ever talk about what I think is probably one of the most important components. And that's that VPC abstraction. Let's just let us focus on our apps, our workloads and our applications. So to help me really dive into, is this even possible? I wanna introduce Alex from Netris to give us a deep dive of his company, his product, and their ambition to bring VPC anywhere, including possibly your data center. With that, we'll welcome Alex to the stage. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for this nice introduction. Uh, so my, my, my background is many years in uh, traditional network engineering, uh, almost like 20 years designing, architecting large scale uh, data center networks. And uh, uh, I'd like to start, uh, you know, just to to give a, a little bit of a context before we 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 get on on onto inf inf environment before we start configuring things. I want to give a little bit of a context and. Uh, I'd like to start with the evolution of uh, networking. So networking kind of started with CLI. And then over time, we've seen SDN, Software Defined Networking, trying to uh, make it kind of more uh, pro programmatic for engineers to consume networking. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, the next one was intent-based networking uh, pretty recently. Uh, thing is that all these technologies, they are amazing uh, for traditional data center and telco environments. Um, but when, when you do need to do this cloud native applications, DevOps methodologies, you need VPC. Those technologies are not fundamentally made for this. VPC is what, uh, what we are seeing in the cloud. It's VPC is what we need. And if we look at the uh, compute infrastructure uh, market growth, we can see that not only public cloud is growing, but also bare metal cloud market is growing, edge growing like crazy, and even data, even traditional data center market is growing. Why is this happening? Is because we need lots of apps. We have lots of data. We want apps for everything and anything. Uh, although most of the apps go to public cloud, uh, it's not that public cloud is not a one size fits all kind of solution because in some cases, regulations require us to take some apps uh, elsewhere. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's, it's a high cost, especially at scale. And in some cases, some applications do require technical requirements like latency, like machine learning applications, like applications dealing with transient data. So <clears throat> my main point is that applications are highly distributed. We have lots of edge use cases. This is 
how things are today and this is how things will be always. Some applications will be on public cloud, some applications will be on bare metal cloud, some applications will be on edge, and some applications will be in traditional data center. Now, this means that engineers have to deal, have to deploy, maintain, and scale applications in all these four types of environments. And in public cloud, that's fairly, uh, it's fairly, uh, uh, convenient to do things programmatically because of VPC. It's declarative, it's quick and safe. It's kind of designed to kind of help engineers to be insanely great. I even think that cloud popularity is uh, very much attributed to VPC. VPC kind of enabled public cloud. And when we think about our other environments, bare metal cloud, edge computer, data center, uh, those environments are based on traditional network operations model. Uh, there's a lot of complexity. At best, there's some kind of homegrown solution, which is different from organization to organization. And we still are seeing lots of silos, like DevOps engineers, NetOps engineers, Network engineers kind of takes a lot of time and it's kind of hard. So we have started Netris to, to, to address this problem, to create a software that brings VPC networking everywhere to, to your bare metal cloud, to edge compute and traditional data center to make both things look like VPC uh, and uh, enable engineers to have kind of similar uh, operational model in both environments. Look at this. This is uh, what networking looks like in Amazon AWS, and it's very similar in any public cloud provider. And this is what networking looks like in a physical data center. You know, DevOps engineers don't need another API. DevOps engineers, they need a VPC type networking for on-prem. So basically, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to take that physical network and make it look like very much like VPC. Uh, so here's the concept. We have this thing called uh, soft gate, which is, you can think about it like a VPC gateway. It's a Linux machine that is running uh, FRR, WireGuard, Kia, different uh, Linux networking tools and software, mainly open source. Uh, Netris SoftGate uh, sits on top of any physical network. It's just a, it's just a software, it's just a machine. You can, you can have that machine in any Cisco network environment, Juniper, in a bare metal cloud like in Equinix, doesn't really matter. Uh, so that's the machine which does uh, uh, packet forwarding. Uh, and, there's, and then there's this Netris controller, which, uh, which has web, uh, web console, which is very similar to public cloud that has a declarative, uh, declarative mindset, has, of course, uh, Terraform integration, Kubernetes and uh, REST API. Uh, but the idea is that you, you configure, you deal with this controller and controller automatically programs uh, VPC gateways, so gate nodes to make network work. And we will see how this works soon in action. All right, this is perfect overview. And I love that, that image of that like telco closet where all the wires are hanging. I'm pretty sure people listening to this or watching this right now are probably responsible <laughs> for creating that mess. And we all know the value of abstractions. And I think you really dialed it in when we start to think about taking all those components. I'm going to remind everyone, all of those components are necessary if you want a real working network. But what isn't necessary is to leak that complexity to everyone else. So having that VPC abstraction layer that gets us back to kind of simple primitives that we can actually use uh, with our networks. Now, one thing I asked before we get into this demo was, 
you know, let's not just show the VPC and a bunch of IP addresses. I really want to call out like very common infrastructures. And, and when we think about VPCs these days, especially for this audience, you know, one common architecture, and I think if you go to the next slide, you have a nice diagram of, you know, a common thing that people do, like, you know, you have this idea that, hey, I want to stand up something like a Kubernetes cluster in your own environment. And I know how challenging that can be, especially during my days at CoreOS, where we were really trying to give people a bunch of nodes and they had to go figure out how to integrate it into their networking. And Kubernetes-based networking has always been a challenge in most of those traditional environments. So maybe you can walk me through kind of this diagram of this setup and maybe uh, let's try to educate those coming from a you know traditional networking background and maybe people who are unfamiliar with most networking architectures that are out there. Mm. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so um, for uh, for for this for this session, we've created this environment where uh, where we took you know a traditional network, so basically a Cisco switch in the middle. Uh, we have connected uh, three physical machines for uh, where where we will run our uh, uh, harvester rancher harvester uh, hypervisor nodes. Uh, we have connected two other physical machines for a, a Softgate one, Softgate two. Those those will be you know highly available uh, VPC gateways. We have one more machine uh, uh, where we run two controllers, Netris controller and Rancher controller. Controller itself is just a K3S cluster, so it's it's uh, you can easily run two two controllers on the on the same machine. Uh, and we have this internet connectivity. Now, this internet connectivity can be a physical cable coming from the ISP with a range of IP addresses and physically plugged into that Cisco switch. That can be a, a cable coming from, if it's a, a, if it's a brownfield environment, that can be a cable coming from traditional routers, from uh, enterprise border routers. Doesn't really matter. Some, we, we just need some sort of internet connectivity to peer our VPC network with the rest of the world. Now, <clears throat> this thing is entirely based on standard protocols. So basically, we, we could have connected uh, a bunch of VMware ESXi nodes. We could have connected bare metal nodes. Just to keep it simple, we, we will stick to this three, three nodes for compute two nodes for south gate uh, and one node for controller but this can basically scale to whatever scale uh, yeah so i think if i were to, if i were to summarize and correct me where i'm wrong here if i were to walk into an existing data center and i look to my left there's some netapp storage some vmware hp blade chassis and all that is working fine right and i look at the top of that rack there's probably a cisco or juniper switch or router combination and so everything is working. And that's what we mean by brownfield. Like things are already there. You're not starting from scratch. And then I decide, you know what? I want to give this whole cloud native thing a try. Maybe I'm going to go buy some new hardware. And let's walk through this diagram. You know, I get a rack right next to this other rack. And instead of going out and buying very expensive networking gear, I go get some standard, maybe network ready um commodity hardware. I rack two of them in the rack. So at the top, you have the two. I get that uplink cable from my network team that's ready to go. It's live. And I plug it into one of the soft gates. The next thing I'm doing is I'm racking maybe a couple of those bare metal or whatever servers that I have. And then maybe I just do another one just to host that rancher and Net Netris controller set. So if I step back and look at this rack, I have this kind of clean setup of you know, dedicated worker nodes, a controller that will be the orchestration layer for the other ones, and two commodity network devices. And at this point, I guess I just need to get the software installed to make all of this come alive. Is that kind of an accurate description of someone that was kind of rolling this together with their own machines in an on-premise data center? Uh, yeah, that's 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 very close to uh, how how people usually test this and. Uh, uh, in, in in some cases, uh, you can have like like a rake of kind of new new equipment. You can always uh, 
peer that with existing network. That's one way to go. Another way is like even if it's like a trial and if if you if you don't really want to do make a lot of changes, if it's just an experiment, do I do I want this solution? I don't know. I want to try, right? You can <clears throat> and uh, like you described, there are a bunch of regs with H HP storage, Dell storage, whatever. You can <clears throat> you can go walk to your infrastructure team and ask for five, six servers, uh, blank servers where you will install just operating systems. And you, you will need to ask your uh, networking team to allocate you a range of VLAN IDs, uh, VLAN IDs that you know will not conflict, will not overlap with other things on the network. And uh, I can actually show then so this is uh, this is Netris controller uh, graphical user interface, and when you install it for the first time, you you see this site. Site is like a region, and this is default configuration. I didn't change anything here. You can see it says VLAN range seven hundred to nine hundred. This means that in this case, Netris will stick to using only these VLAN IDs. But if your network team is happy with a different range, that's totally fine. Just edit and type there the right range. Uh, so that's it. Basically, VPC services will stick to using these uh, VLAN IDs. Whenever traffic exchange is happening between Softgate 1, for example, and Harvester 3, it in the middle, it will be uh, encapsulated using one of these VLAN IDs, and that's how traffic will pass through existing uh, enterprise switch without requiring network team to make big changes. That's the whole idea. For every service, you, you only deal with soft gates, with netries, with your, you know, with components that are plugged into VPC. But the moment VPC traffic is needs to travel the traditional network, it encapsulates into one VLAN ID, goes through that network, and then decapsulates back. So look, we already jumped into the demo. I think we just pop over there and, and really go through this. So we just talked about kind of that base install, hardware is now mounted. We got our configuration in place. So now it's like, you know, when I go to a cloud provider and you had a nice screenshot in the presentation, you know, typically when I create a VPC, I'm tend to be presented with like a list of subnets that I can choose either for VMs or, you know, various clusters that I want to attach to them. Maybe walk me through what does that look like from this perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <clears throat> so uh, there's this uh, uh, IPAM part where all the IP addresses are kind of registered. And this uh, you, you can see this list of private IP addresses, so slash 20s. Those are by default configured there, created there. I didn't create them. And uh, whenever I want to create uh, a new network, new virtual network, uh, I can use one of these slash 20 IP addresses. Uh, now, if we look at the, I have created few networks. To, to make this whole thing work, but we, we will create a couple of new networks soon. Uh, so the very first network is this network called hypervisor. So VNet, we call them VNets, virtual network. Uh, and we can see it is using this subnet from, from that list, this slash 20. Uh, this is where a uh, rancher uh, harvester hypervisors are living. First, second, third, and you, you can see that those machines have received IP address from, from that network. That's, uh, sorry, these three machines. But they also need to have some kind of a gateway, uh, which is softgate1, softgate2, physically. And we can see that in our inventory, softgate1, softgate2, they are green. Uh, we can see traffic, memory, and stuff utilization. 
But the nice thing is, all, all this is happening behind the scenes. I, I didn't configure these things. What I, what I did, I have only created this DNet, uh, attached that IP address, and that's it. My, uh, my rancher got this, uh, my rancher hypervisors got this minimal connectivity, so nodes can talk to each other, can reach out to, uh, to controller, uh, and make the cluster work. So it looks pretty straightforward. I create a VPC. I get a range of subnets. Then I can come over here and allocate any of those ranges like you showed earlier. Those hypervisors are going to the low-level nodes. But you were in Harvester. So do we have to tell Harvester anything about this network topology? Like, How does it know uh, that these networks are something that it should be using? Is there any configuration that needs to be done on the Harvester side? And I'm assuming Harvester is this thing that helps us provision things. So is there anything I have to plug in on the Harvester side to tell it about these subnets at all? Uh, uh, so uh, I have one service, one Kubernetes cluster called Kubernetes Prod1 that's up and running there. But let's let's create one more. Let's create a new one. So I will uh, describe uh, the process and what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, let's say we want to create, I don't know, Kubernetes test. Uh, I select the site. We only have single region in this case. Uh, we attribute this to DevOps team. And we, we pick one, the next available range of IP addresses, next slash 20 that's available. For VLAN ID, we, we leave it assigned automatically. So Netris will choose one of the available VLAN IDs. Uh, we click add. Now this is provisioning. It will finish soon. So everything starts from creating the VNet from, from here. Now when this is provisioned, we need to uh, we need to create a network inside a harvester. So I will go to home and we'll walk step by step. So I go to virtualization manager, uh, then harvester cluster, <clears throat> advanced networks. And this is the, you can see network that I've added before, but now I'm going to add a new one. I paste the name here, and I need this VLAN ID that Netris has generated to, to type the same VLAN ID here, 703. So now both endpoints, they know which VLAN ID to use, so traffic reaches the, the right place. We click if create. I, if, I, if I'm looking at this correctly, this feels like the same flow you typically do with like a VMware setup, right? Like if I bring in EXXI, I have to bring in this networking information. So it sounds like Harvester is like this true hypervisor layer that's going to let us create VMs or whatever. And this is where we plug in uh, those network settings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the same, same flow would be if, if, if you do with the, with the VMware. Uh, okay, now at this point, when we, we have the, the network ready, and now we can go to cluster management and we can try to create a new cluster. Uh, <clears throat> Kubernetes test. Let's ask for three machines. Uh, default namespace. <clears throat> now I'm going to tell a rancher which network to use because now there are both networks available, and here's the name for that new network. Okay. Now, while, while that's creating, this feels a very similar to like an EKS or AKS or GKE workflow, right? You come here, and I'm assuming Harvester is doing the hard work of creating the necessary VMs, Programming, programming them to be on the right network, in this case, this VLAN ID, tagging all of the network traffic. So as it flows through, all the intermediate components will do the right thing in terms of handling those network packets. 
and giving me this, this feel of like, hey, as long as you have a network in place, uh, ideally you will have the ability to create clusters and just attach them to the network that you've assigned. Uh, true. Uh, why are we getting this error? Uh, let's refresh the interface, maybe. Seems like uh, some kind of front end error. Uh, but it's actually creating. It's it's actually started the process. Well, you uh, know what we'll do? We'll just leave that for feedback for the Harvester team. And like all good demos, it looks like we already have a cluster that's going. So I'm pretty sure I can imagine how that will be provisioned. There'll be some NCD, there'll be some worker nodes, and then ideally you'll probably be able to pull down a kube config. Is there an ability to get a kube config from that prod one cluster up there while we're waiting for this other one to finish? Absolutely. Uh, we can qu just quickly check one thing. Uh, we can go to Harvester for one moment and see what's happening underneath. If we click on virtual machines, all right, we can see that these three virtual machines have created like two minutes ago. <clears throat> we can see that they have even received these IP addresses automatically. And those are the right IP addresses that we have selected here. We didn't tell this information to a harvester. This is just happens uh, automatically. Um, okay, so going back to cluster, now I'm assuming VMs are being installed and uh, Kubernetes is being installed, but that takes some time. Uh, mm -hmm. So not to wait, like you suggested, let's go and look to this other cluster, Kubernetes Prod 1. And totally, we can download kubeconfig here for the first cluster. <clears throat> uh, and I can do so I guess at this point you're going to configure your kube config with those credentials you've just downloaded uh, so that you can actually interact with it via kubectl so for those probably looking at this uh, this is an easy way to actually deal with multiple clusters, especially ones that you just created, and you want to make sure that the kubectl is pointing to that to that set. Yep, and it is responding. Six nodes are up and running. Now, so what does this look like on the Netris side? So Harvester is using that VLAN or that VPC that we've carved out, or at least a subnet from that VPC that's kind of represented as that VLAN. So look, Harvester knows all these things. Kubernetes knows all these things. But I'm interested to see what it looks like from the Netris console, like people that are managing the network. What do they see? <clears throat> so uh, that, that's a good question. And to your point, people that are managing the traditional network, they, in from their perspective, these are just some packets going back and forth. They don't know any of these uh, details. We're not disturbing them. They are not disturbing uh, this VPC. Everyone are happy. Now, uh, from Netris uh, console, per, uh, from Netris web console perspective, uh, well, uh, uh, this this cluster came out is up and running. So obviously, cluster has at least connectivity with Rancher controller. That's that's how Rancher works. Cluster needs to uh, access their controller. Uh, but but there's also uh, this other component of Netris operator, which I, to save everyone's time, I have previously installed it already. Uh, here is it. Uh, Netris operator that's running. So <clears throat> this operator is talking to Netris controller. It's authenticated 
with credentials. Uh, and now if I deploy an application in Kubernetes, which, uh, which is using a service of type load balancer, for example, Netris controller will be able to understand this. Uh, let me actually show this. Uh, this is a uh, uh, layer, layer four load balancer, kind, kind of like elastic load balancer functionality in Netris. And we can see that no nothing is there. We, we, could, we could create one using web console. Uh, we, we could pick protocol. We could uh, you know, enable health checks and type in backend IP addresses. In, in, in this case, this would work just a, just a regular load balancer. Uh, but in this case, we can actually deploy application. I have this basic application here, pod info that is uh, using service of type load balancer. Uh, let's try to deploy it. And before you do that, I think it's uh, important to go back to that pod info and let's explain something to folks really quickly. So there's going to be a lot of people that are new to Kubernetes that are coming to this. There's going to be people that are um, experience with Kubernetes. Maybe we go back to that config really quick and I can see at the top uh, things will be provisioning, but let's go look at the pod info for one more second. Um, I think what you're kind of highlighting here is that given that, that that controller is there, we see that when you create this service type load balancer, what's happening is it feels like you're doing the integration work on the Netra side, meaning that you're dealing with whatever is required to provide the IP address, the load balancer service, the service discovery integration, pulling that IP information up. Oh, there you go. You can see it there. Pulling the IP information from Kubernetes. So I guess a lot of people, if you've ever used any of the cloud services before, this would be the equivalent of like, like a network layer load balancer, right? And you can send traffic directly to these pods. But it, it, I think it also shows off the first class integration here you don't have to come to this console and then pop back to Kubernetes. You can keep your normal Kubernetes workflow, put everything in the manifest, use native Kubernetes ways of articulating things like type load balancer. And that's enough information for the Netris controller to take over and pull in that config and be responsible for creating the network services required to make it work just like people would experience and other fully managed kind of Kubernetes environments. So I think that part is really important to call out uh, to show people that, hey, the, the goal is once you have these abstractions is that people can just ignore the undertone and focus on their normal Kubernetes workflows. Yeah, absolutely. And actually to, uh, to show that further, I can, uh, I can edit this number of replicas from three to 10, let's say. Uh, save and if i apply this again we can see that more pods are now starting container creating those are still in the process and uh, on netris side we can see that netris now detected more ip addresses because we we have six nodes in this kubernetes cluster and originally, PodInfo was running only on three nodes. That's why we had only three IP addresses. Now Netris understood, okay, now it is running on more nodes. So Netris has populated more, uh, more IP addresses of nodes into load balancer service. And when you say nodes here, I'm assuming you're referring to pods. I mean, there's probably still three nodes in the cluster, but these pods are the ones that are pulling in these IP addresses, right? So these are natively the science of the pod. So we're going, you know, we're, we're honoring the true Kubernetes networking model where these pods are being assigned first class IPs from the subnet, right? So when they're communicating or things are communicating to that, you're kind of going point to point. And, and I think that's the best way to think about kind of doing that Kubernetes model. And the other thing I want to say is shout out to anyone that's working on this console at Netris. The fact that you're giving people that real time feedback where it's automatically updating. I'm running commands at the bottom console and then seeing that live kind of preview, respecting the health checks and then moving, letting people know what's going on. 
That is a beautiful touch. So I just wanted to shout out really quickly to whoever did that. Golden, great, great job there. Thank you so much. Our, our, our guys will be super excited. Um, so I think, I think we showed a lot here. I mean, you know, maybe if there's something that we've missed, but, you know, for me, when I think about lots of people that are trying to go on prem, thinking about what does it take, at least from a networking perspective, to be ready for that dynamic set of environments that people want. Because I think the thing that puts the most stress, whether you're the best network engineer in the world, whether you have great automation tools, I can guarantee you when people bring in Kubernetes, they have this expectation of being able to grab dynamic IPs. What we're not really showing here is that if you restart one of those pods, it can land on a different node, get a different IP. And the expectation of you know developers and platform teams is that those IPs will dynamically be updated. IPAM management will be fully automatic. And the load balancer will follow things like health checks and service discovery to pre-populate everything. I think this is the problem most people have with the Kubernetes networking model. It will challenge whatever you have existently. And so if you don't have the ability to carve out VPCs and dynamic subnets and then do the full integration with the Kubernetes networking model, that's when people start complaining and that's when you feel like you're falling short. I mean, did we capture everything? It looks like we went through everything. If we've missed something, I think now would be a good time to kind of bring it up and show it. So uh, to 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 add a little bit on 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 that uh, in in terms of <coughs> IP addresses of pods, nodes, and so on, uh, <coughs> and network engineering challenges, we uh, we're 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 we we're, we're very much neutral, and we understand that different people have different uh, preferences. Someone may may want to use one CNI. Cilium or, or Calico, someone may want to use in one mode, another mode. For, for, for us, it's not much different. We, we support all, all kinds of configurations. Someone is happy using Calico, totally fine. Uh, our, our operator is able to understand that. If someone is uh, switching into Calico's BGP mode, this is their kind of highly advanced mode, we understand even that, and we in, we know how to respond on our side, how to configure things that things kind of automatically, uh, seamlessly, you know, w work together. Uh, as well as if it's just a simple simple setup with few few nodes without complicated CNIs, still it's it's cool for us. We we're just trying to support all these uh, common use cases. Uh, awesome. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Proceed. Yeah, let's see if this even works. So uh, this uh, this service received this IP address. So what what happened? Basically, Netris has assigned next available public IP address to the service and pushed that information to Kubernetes. Same IP address here and there in console. But let's see if even if this even works. Okay, <clears throat> we can, uh, so it works. We can even use curl to uh, to make sure that it is being served by uh, different different pods. It's not, so actually load bal balancing is actually uh, working. I can do, oh. So it's changing. All right, perfect. Look, I think we're at the end of the demo, but I do have a few questions and I know I've sourced a few questions before we started. And so one of the questions that I think a lot of people want to know is, you know, why haven't people thought about VPC or different abstractions on prem? I mean, in your slide deck, you went through SDN, you went through network automation. You know, why is that not enough? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, well, well, physical networks, they are kind of designed to move uh, packets and traffic really well, which is fine. Like this is their 
their specialization, if, if you will. They, they do this really well. VPC is, in, in my opinion, uh, public cloud uh, became possible not because you put your server somewhere else, but because, because it, it was rela relatively easy and fast to use. You know, when, when you want to iterate and, and people in this world, they want to iterate a lot, right? We're, we're not, uh, we're, we're, we're not, we're not uh, in the age where like designing something takes like 10 years. No, we're, we're in the software age where we want to ship something, make changes and ship again. We want to ship many times a day. So basically it's iterations uh, that, that are important for the business. And VPC is making this possible. So I don't need to go and communicate internally with multiple, we, we don't need to do kind of five meetings to decide how to, how to add or remove one, one villain or something. That's, in my opinion, that's why VPC is extremely powerful to make this, you know, iteration DevOpsy type mindset possible. And before starting Netris, when I was looking to public cloud and being myself a person coming from traditional data center, I was like, oh my God, this VPC thing, this is insanely great in public cloud. This is I wish this is available everywhere, like in every network, every data center, every edge, bare metal cloud, even, even my little home network, everything should have this. This is kind of how I thought about this. All right. So look, the next question, if I look at the list, one of the most common things is like, you know, we talked about how VPC and abstractions are great in the cloud. You know, we clicked around a lot in the console so the next question is, is there things like APIs or Terraform support? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So yeah, I, I showed everything in web console. Um, there's also REST API, which uh, for example, someone who's like potentially embedding Netris can, can use REST API, there's Swagger built in. Uh, but what is, kind of more uh, more designed for uh, uh, for DevOps engineers that's that's of course terraform and I I have here a little example of that so uh, to save everyone's time just uh, we'll show the resources so uh, in this terraform file I I have summarized kind of uh, Netris resources, L like in, in previous example, we have created this Kubernetes cluster. Let's say we want to do the same, but with Terraform. So this is Netris resource. This is VNet that we have created. Uh, this is Harvester resource, and this is Rancher resource. So basically in this example, I'm using two Terraform providers. Netris provider and Rancher provider. And if I do this, let's say if we go to VNet here uh, and so we can see this is what Terraform is trying to do. So trying to create uh, Netris resource, the same VNet, and basically what I did from inside the Rancher from web console, but through Terraform. <clears throat> so process has started and uh, it, it, it actually takes some time. Uh, I can see that it already created the K8 staging network. That one looks new, pretty recent. It has the latest date, and I can see it from the logs right there. So it seems like the API is super responsive. Uh, yeah, this, this, this has been created. And if, if we look into Rancher, actually, K8 staging is creating here too. There, 
they're API responsive too. What, what is this thing waiting here? It's, it is kind of waiting until the cluster is up and running and only then Terraform will finish the work, which, which takes some time, like a few minutes, five, 10 minutes. Uh, but yeah, of course, there's Terraform. How without Terraform? And I also want to call out that it looks like your demo healed itself and that other cluster you were making earlier, the Kubernetes test cluster, looks like it's up and running. So yeah, it may have been a UI issue. So it's nice to see that uh, get resolved. So don't tempt the demo, guys. No need to connect to it. Just let it shine bright, nice and green, good to go. All right, so I think we got time for maybe one or two more questions. And, you know, when people are looking at this and they're asking themselves, like, how do I get started? You know, is it best for them to kind of start with like a small POC, you know, get new hardware? What's the best way for people that are watching this? Maybe they're super excited. Maybe they look at this and say, yes, this is the missing piece. What's the best way for them to get started with this? Uh, <clears throat> good question. So, so I, I would recommend similar basic setup like this, just like two machines for soft gate, one, one machine for controller and two, three, like just, just a handful of machines for, uh, for compute nodes. Uh, on, in, in our documentation page, there is, uh, uh, there is this install guide on uh, VPC Anywhere Getting Started guide. It describes the concept and it works, you know, step by step through how you install controller. Controller installation is basically a one-liner that you copy and paste on Ubuntu, Linux, or any Linux. It will stand up a kube cluster and NetRisk controller. Um, then you install softgate nodes, uh, which is again very basic. You when when you install uh, NetRisk controller, you'll see these two softgate nodes. They will already exist there, but everything here will be red. Heartbeat will be red because you will need to actually provision that softgate machines, which is again a one-liner command. You copy here and paste on machine, wait a few minutes until it installs. Uh, that's pretty much it. There are examples. To, we, we're also on Slack. Uh, so people are welcome to join our uh, community Slack channel where other users and our engineers are there happy to answer all kinds of questions. Awesome. And look, I think that was super dope. We got a nice demo. I mean, the big takeaways for me were we can bring the cloud-like abstractions, the VPC on-prem. Also, it doesn't seem like we have to throw away everything we have. So this works well in brownfield scenarios as well, where we already have a setup. We can work with our team to give us a range of VLANs, give that to Netris, and then we can now have a great way of partitioning that network. And this should sound real familiar from people coming from that VMware or a world where you know you did the same thing for your hypervisors, but now instead of just getting network automation, we're actually getting back to that world where you get that VPC, you have subnets to choose from. I don't know about y'all, but I remember the days of people trying to track all this stuff in the spreadsheet. And now we have a full console, we have visibility, and we have something that actually understands the Kubernetes networking models, not just the node level, not just at the pod level, but even things like L4 networking load balancers and health checks and making sure that you can scale and remove things dynamically. So this is really dope, really wonderful. Uh, I want to say big shout out to Alex and the whole Netris team who helped put this together. I know your company is pretty new and like this is just the beginning for them. I know we'll be at KubeCon probably talking more about this later. Uh, maybe any foul, foul, uh, final words for people in the audience and where people can catch up with you later if they have more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Kelsey, and thanks everyone who's who's watching this. Uh, um, hey, uh, g give Netris a try. It's it's really easy. We are looking forward to your to your feedback, positive feedback, negative feedback. All feedback is helpful. Uh, we're, we, we have the Slack channel, so if you go to uh, netris.ai slash Slack, that's, that's how you can join our 
uh, Slack community channel. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, uh, Alex Saroyan. That's my handler. Uh, it's also on the CNCF page, uh, registration page for this webinar. Uh, if if you're visiting KubeCon, please come visit our booth. We we will have demo and we will have multiple environments to where you will be able to play around with the product talk to people who built the product and give them feedback learn from them exchange with experience uh, yeah looking forward to that all right awesome all right thank everyone for attending i'll be around i'm going to keep my eye on this in general because i do think we need new abstractions kubernetes was a great abstraction for compute and it's nice to see that we're pushing past automation to new abstractions. And maybe, just maybe, this VCP Anywhere concept will take on. We'll catch y'all next time. Later.